This is Inspiring Careers with your host, Ingrid Centurion. We're gonna talk about fascinating technologies that will impact your future. Meet inspiring entrepreneurs and people that are making huge differences in the community and around the world. We're gonna share career and life lessons of inspiration and success. Our mission is to inspire our viewers to make a better life for themselves by sharing our stories, our interviews, and documentaries. Please stay tuned as we have incredible guests coming up. Hi, today we have Brandel D. Randolph, who's the founder and owner of 1854 Cycling Company, located here in Framingham. He is also the co-founder and executive director of Project Poverty, a nonprofit organization that aims to design, create, and implement innovative strategies to reduce poverty. His work with the disadvantaged populations earned him a TED Talk at the inaugural TEDx, Texas Tech University in 2013, titled, Stop Throwing Breakfast Sandwiches at the Poor. He is an author, and his 2010 book, Me and My Broke Neighbor, The Seven Things I Learned About Success Just by Living Next to Him, has been added to financial literacy curriculum across the country. Randell is making a huge difference in the community and around the world. His 2016 release, Like Cavemen and Quail, Poverty Beyond Income and Mindset. Thank you for being on the show today. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for <laughs> I'm so glad me. that you're here. All right, thank you. I know we went out and we visited the the factory. Yes. And it was a really hot day that day. <laughs> yes, oh my goodness, yes. I sweat it through my shirt. <laughs> oh my but goodness. you're doing some really great things and you have a great background. You really want to help your community. Yes. And so I wanted to share some background about you and, and what got you to write these two books. Where did you grow up and how did you end up here in Framingham? Oh, well, I grew up in a place called Dallas, Louisiana, and I met my wife, and um, I met my wife in Chicago. She actually has her PhD, and we ended up in Framingham because we wanted some place that was very uh, racially diverse and economically diverse to where our kids would be uh, filled welcome into a community where it felt like home. And we started looking at the websites, websites and we found Framingham to be almost perfect. Wonderful, that's really good. And now you're making a big impact in the community. Tell us about what ignited you to write these two books. Well, what happened with the first book um, was uh, when I was a broker, I was invited to do a financial literacy curriculum or a financial literacy curriculum that was going to be done in the inner city. However, after doing about 10 minutes of this, I found out that, that these kids had n could not relate to the materials they were being offered because a lot of them were not familiar with people who only even had bank accounts or how bank accounts worked, which, which required savings and checking and all these other things, balancing a checkbook. And so I created Me and My Broke Neighbor as something to help them bridge that gap between what they, where they are now and financial literacy cr that exist. Right. You know? And so I love the title of the story. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> so you don't go to your neighbor's house for like eggs or anything because well, it's broke all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't just, just it, it, when you read the book, it, it's just kind of amazing because he wasn't just broke. It was like right. he was, um, at first he, he, he was doing something else, but then he had a lot of money. Oh, okay. And he was just throwing it away. Right. And you'd realize how he was throwing his money away. Right. And that's how you learn about financial literacy. I know. You so. can make a lot of money and still end up with nothing. Or, yes. you know, you've really got to learn to save and all these things that you're saying. Exactly. So that's really good. You'll really be able to help the community out there. And, yes. And this is, what age group was this book for? Oh, that book was for 7th and 8th graders. 7th and 8th graders. 7th okay, and 8th graders, good. yes. All right. Uh, so um, what inspired you to start your business, 1854? Share with us the story, the background, mm -hmm. and how that transpired? Um, previous to doing anything with um, the 1854 Cycling Company, I had a nonprofit called Project Poverty. And um, it was amazing. And part of my work was the research that I talk about in the Like Caveman and Quail book, in which I take uh, 30 different demographic factors and data sets, and we find out what, it, what the most disproportionate population who are in poverty look like for any, for any geographical area. Here in Framingham, as opposed to Boston or Texas or somewhere else, but here in Framingham, it looks like women who are formerly incarcerated. Mm -hmm. 
they have a disproportionate number of them who live beneath the poverty threshold. In fact, the average median income was only 11,500, and 80% of those women are mothers. And I wanted to do something that was really effective that can change the direction in the arc of their lives. So having a for-profit business that created jobs for them was my mission, and it really didn't matter what we made. I stumbled across bicycles. Okay. <laughs> Interestingly enough, I stumbled across bicycles as things like that. So when I tell people that I have a cycling company, they first imagine that I love and I'm passionate about bicycles, but I can't change a flat tire. <laughs> but <laughs> my, my expertise is in poverty alleviation. Right. And living wage employment is the key to poverty alleviation mm -hmm. most of the time. Wow, that's a very honorable thing to mm. do. My mom was a single mom and she mm. raised four children yes. with uh, ten thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. you know as a waitress so she struggled and so yes. I understand that and you also 1854 it's more than a cycling company you have a clothesline yes. that goes along with it yes the apparel um, because one of the things we found out early on in our business is that not everyone can afford a bicycle or wants to ride a bicycle so we started making apparel you know t-shirts hoodies and hats and other things but we have other things coming and we found out that that caught on. So now you go to our Instagram, you see celebrities and everyone else wearing these, these abolitionist t-shirts and hoodies and things like that. And that has propelled a lot of the revenue and a lot of the branding awareness of our business. Well, I think you have a great brand. I really like mm -hmm. it, 1854. How yes. did you come up with that title, name? <laughs> because we, we want to learn all about yeah. William and Eleanor Kraft. Yes, we will. So what it is is that, well, I'm sort of a closet history buff, and Framingham is one of the most significant things that happened here in Framingham, happened in the year 1854. This was the year of the first anti-slavery rally in the country, and it occurred on the 4th of July. And on this day, um, they had noted abolitionists from uh, Sojourner Truth to Henry David Thoreau, and most importantly, there was a man, his name was William Lloyd Garrison, and he owned a newspaper that talked, talked about the anti-slavery movement. But on this day here in Framingham, he took the U.S. Constitution and he burned it because it was hypocritical to celebrate independence while half of our population was enslaved. And it happened right here in Framingham. And that galvanized the abolitionist movement. And just as a homage to Framingham, I call it the 1854 Cycling Company. Wow, that is really, really good. Yes. I love that. Because <laughs> not only are you educating framing hammers <laughs> <Yes. laughs> of its history mm -hmm. it, that's so powerful. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, I always remember 1854 yeah. um, now and the whole story. Yeah. Tell us more about William and Eleanor Kraft because your bicycles are named after them. Yes, so all my bicycles are named after abolitionists and the first pair of his and hers bikes or a step through and a, and a, and a full bike and a top two bike were named after a pair of abolitionists called William and Eleanor Kraft. How they became famous was that she was very fair-skinned, and he um, was not, but she posed as an elderly white slave owner, and he her servant, and they had lost, and they had pretended to have lost their ticket, and they were on their way to see a, a fellow serviceman or something like that, so they basically um, gave the story to wherever they went, but they were able to ride trains and buses all the way up from Macon, Georgia to freedom in, in Alabama, um, I'm sorry, in, <laughs> in Philadelphia. Right. To freedom in Philadelphia. And after their story came out and they were this and they were great, um, it wasn't long before the Fugitive Slave Act came into play. And so they, they eventually became noted abolitionists, talk about slavery and what they went through uh, as being enslaved and they became abolitionists later on. And I wanted this to be part of the history and things that we tell, not only with the, their present names on our bike, but as part of the, the, who the company um, are and what we represent when we write abolitionist on our bicycles. Okay. So now when they go to the website, they see abolitionist. They understand yes. the story behind it all. Yes. In 1854, and, and it all started right here in Framingham. Yes. That's really powerful. Your first bike, what did you name your first bike? <laughs> I named my first bike after William Lord Garrison, the Garrison. And it was this beautiful uh, bike. <laughs> it was beautiful. <laughs> and it had leather handles, leather seats, and leather appointments. It even had a leather attache bag. But what people didn't tell me was that most high-end cyclists are vegan. 
so they don't really want you to touch leather. <laughs> so this oh, no. great $3,000 bike I put on the market sold absolutely none. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> so I had to make a bike that was more, um, that was more efficient, more towards what people um, would like to see. And that's how we came with the crafts. How many of the garrisons did you sell? Zero. Really? I didn't sell any well, we garrisons at all. We need to find some meat eaters out there. Yeah, I, I, didn't, sell, I, didn't, sell any, I didn't sell. No, I didn't sell any garrisons at all. But the, but the smart thing about my business is that I didn't make make many either. Okay. So I didn't really lose that. But but the uh, crafts when we put them on the market, we sold uh, close to almost a hundred thousand dollars of, of just those two bikes. Now your second bike was the Craft City and the Craft Racer. Yes, those those were the second pair of bikes that we had on the market, and those sold really well. People love the colors. People love the customization points. People love the fact that we were giving them ways which would make it fully um, elect electronically assisted. You got a lot of media, and articles came out in certain papers. You were telling me that that was one of the things the that really launched you, the catalyst yes. that started yes. selling bikes. What happened there? Oh, so in October of 2017, I got this random phone call from Bloomberg Magazine. They found us some kind of way, and they put us on their website, in their magazine, and things like that, and we just went boom. And we started selling bikes all over the world. Uh, How many it, countries have you sold the bikes in? Uh, we would say about eight oh, wow, right now. Awesome. We've sold about eight, um, which includes which include Germany, Sweden, France, Germany, Canada, and Mexico. And uh, we were trying to get one to Brazil, but we had some issues with uh, with customs and things like that. But we are now an international brand. T-shirts have gone all over the world as well. We've sold them to the UK. We've been all over. What are some of the quotes on your T-shirts? Oh, there's one um, quote from Sojourner Truth call, and it says, I will shake every place I go to. I love that one. That one is because when the Civil War was over, the suffrage movement began, and they were looking for great spokesmen to help kick off the suffrage movement. So Kennedy Dean Staten and, and uh, Susan B. Anthony recruited Sojourner Truth to join their movement. However, they're forgetting that this was an 80-year-old woman who had just, who had, who had, was born in slavery, who had just come out of the, so, you know, had right. just come out of the Civil War and, you know, the abolitionist movement. They told her to be more ladylike, because she has a tendency to shake the rooms <laughs> when she spoke. And so, she ended her speech at this great women's conference in, in uh, New York, and she said, "And I will, when I finish going up north, and I will shake every place I go to, as a thumbs, you know, to." these women who wanted to be more ladylike. And I think that's a great uh, statement for all of us. That's right, you have to be who you are. Yes. And, and she, was, she had a message. Yes. And that was, I love that story. And, and, and it was just wonderful, and people forget this about a lot of the abolitionists. They were who they were, and they had to be bolder, which makes the present day movements sort of like, we have to really conceptualize and remember who we are in the course of these movements, because it's a thing to move, move it helps move us forward. I wonder if we could find some of her talks or maybe read up on yes. some background. She sounds like a very powerful, inspirational woman. Yes, yeah, she is. And there are plenty of plays and books about her. It's, it's amazing. And let's see, now, we, have we spoken about all your bikes? Which no, one we, we haven't. We haven't. We, uh, the one that we're missing is one called The Truth. Okay. Named after Joiner Truth, incidentally, and it's a cargo bike. Um, this this occurred when I was in Shanghai, in China, and I noticed that their form of transportation is this electric assisted cargo bike, which uh, allows 300 pounds to sit in the front and it has a wheel in the back, and it's amazing. And they use this not only as a form of transportation, but as a form of doing small errands and things like that. And I thought that it would be a great thing to bring here to the U.S. I love the styling of it, and that bike, we've sold a lot. We've sold a lot of those bikes, and our typical customers have been moms. And what are they using the bikes for? To take the kids back and forth to the parks, to gyms, um, and it's usually the smaller kids who can't really ride bikes themselves. They're using it for errands. Uh, I've had seniors put things in the front in their basket to go from wherever the community is to their local grocery store and run their own errands to get their exercise in. And I just love the fact that we have this bike on the market with this big basket in the front. And in 2019, we're going to be able to customize it. 
Wow, that's wonderful. So that's better than buying the golf cart. Yes, yes. Get because one of your bikes. <laughs> Price yes. comparison possibly could be the same. Uh, actually, we're we're trying to bring down the price. Right. You know, even with the tariff situation that we have going on in the industry, we're trying to bring down the prices of all of our uh, bikes and materials and parts, and it should be more price conscious. Yeah. What are some of the challenges you've had with your business since um, you started it? Since we started it, the fluctuation of parts, of the price of parts, it's not a situation where you can just source of source your, all your stuff here in the U.S. because a lot of people who are making here in the U.S. still get their raw materials from other places. So when other places are raising their prices and the income prices are raising, my suppliers are raising their price as well, and the challenge is not raising it and putting that burden on our consumers. So I'm trying to be more cost conscious of that. Mm. And How did you find your investors? Um, a lot of my investors came from the TV and, um, and print coverage that I have, but I have particular investors that came through this, this accelerator program I'm working with now called Mass Challenge. It's where they take the top 128 startups in the world because almost 11 countries are represented in this thing. So it's 128 companies out of um, close to 3,000 that apply. And are in, there are a number of investors that reach out to us. And the key is that not every investor who wants to give you money has your good <laughs> has your goodwill in mind. Right. You know, they don't want what's best for your companies. And so please keep in mind that not every investor fits with your vision. So we have to be more conscious of that. But I would tell any startup to work on your craft be good at what you can do and answer all the questions that deal with the financial things because having a sale helps you understand your customer but once you understand your customer you know who you are as a company and let's talk about your last bike yes the, the current one that you have working yeah so the current bike now is a bike called the Thoreau named after Henry David Thoreau who was a noted abolitionist he wrote um, actually, he gave a speech that later became Slavery in Massachusetts, which is one of the great, great books of his, uh, you know, in his canon. So we have a bike that is a mountain bike that we named after him that we're currently um, marketing to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. It's going to be an electric assisted, lightweight electric assisted bicycle that will be capable of carrying things in the back. And also we're thinking about other technologies and things like that to put on to give the to give the police officers something that they can be more um, present in the community, because if we're talking about community policing and knowing your knowing your neighbors and things like that, and it's sort of a visible thing that we want to make sure that they have a presence and they can see the see the see their neighbors and get to know their faces and things like that. Yeah, it would be nice to. A lot of times you don't see the cops, right? They're hiding. Yeah, yeah they're, 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 <laughs> or, or, or they're in their or they're in their cars and things like that, which right, is right, which right. is great. But for things like downtown Framingham, I see I see a squadron of police cars that can go through the crowds or be on the sidewalk and provide assistance and things like that. But we look at how cities are transitioning to urban walking populations and things like that. And I believe that having a having law enforcement agencies able to engage in this is going to lead to more great community interactions between law enforcement and normal citizens. Well, that's really good. Now, let, let's see. You got a bike in here. Let's yes. bring the bike over here and tell us a little bit about it. Okay. We can All right. we can bring it up to the front. Oh, okay, I'll bring it to the front. And he'll he'll get the the view from the front. Okay. So. 1854 abolitionists. Yes, yeah, so this is the, let's see, okay, great, hold on just a moment, put it on the stand. Oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> put it on the stand right there. Yes, yeah, so, ow. So this is the Craft City. This is one of our uh, step over bikes. This is one of our most popular designs. Right. And um, it has, has great appointments, great slick, but one thing that people love about this is the vintage styling. Most bikes you see now don't Vintage have Vintage styling. Yes. They don't have this sort of bar that comes straight down here. Okay. This is a something from the old 80s, 70s bicycles that right. came out of France and Europe. Okay. But the, uh, the beautiful thing about this bike, as opposed to some of the other bikes you see on the market, is that this provides an upright riding style. 
Oh, that's right. You were telling yes. me so that so, way you're not all yes, so, so hunched over. So you're not over, hunched you're over like straight, this. So you have to you nice sit straight, straight up. Okay. And it, it makes and you very. People like that. And people love that right. because not only are you more in control, but you're more visible to cars as well. So, as, so when you ride this bike, it just gives you all kinds of uh, beautiful things. And this is another thing I picked up from being overseas and seeing all that stuff. And the other thing about this bike is that the people who make this bike love to see this one because it represents something that's bolder, more assigned. And um, I just want to make sure that our steel frame bicycles stand out. So we can get this bike in a myriad of colors and customizations. And this is one that we did for a client. And um, we just love to sell these. We talked about, OK, let's, let's put okay. it back over there. All right. <laughs> I can do this as faster. You customize bikes. Yes. So, and so if someone wanted a bike, yes, they could have a bike in two weeks. Custom order. It depends. Because um, well, right now yeah. with some some of the parts things yeah. going on. You're but but it, but if you tell me you want a banana stripe bicycle with Pokemon yellow, I would have to find that paint and other things like that. But we probably can get it done for you, because we've had customers that have that have done that. Uh, you know, we had this one com one customer. It's a huge Prince fan. <laughs> Wanted the Prince purple, and this actually took a frame. And so we did that for them. And right. it took us about a week and a half, maybe two. Most of that was paint, making sure that we had the, the bicycle painted the right way. You, as a solo entrepreneur working really hard at doing all this, what is something you need help with right now? Right it's, now. How could we help you grow your business? Right now, the growth of my business is going to sustain, we're going to be on the establishment of my factory and my facility. And what we're looking for now is the right facility in the right location that's going to be able to support the lives of the people we're trying to employ. Because it's not just going to be a place where they can go and work and leave. We're going to have on-site daycare centers. We're going to have a on-site counseling, trauma counseling, on-site community resource guide. And all these things will require us being in a real estate, or, I'm sorry, in a piece of property that can sustain all that. Because we've had a lot of trouble leasing and things like that. Because when I tell people I'm trying to um, hire the formerly incarcerated, some of the other tenants don't want, they feel very uncomfortable with that. So you really need a community partner? You need a real estate? You, you need someone who really wants to improve the community? Yes. And the economic disadvantaged yes. people in yes. the community? And, and, and that's pretty much what will, because that gives us all the credibility that we need, because the people who we hire need to see that the community is behind them. And how much land do you think you need? Um, an acre is fine. An acre? An acre is fine. If we can do 15,000 square feet just, just to start and get it right. Because they're um, all going to be riding their bike to work. Well, we think. <laughs> we think. We hope. We, we hope during the, during the warm months they will be. Right. Other than that, um, I'm not a big fan of riding on the streets with no infrastructure. After seeing the infrastructure in bigger cities and how it works and how safe it is, I'm not a fan of places that just give you a small little line here on the side of the road. And when do you plan on launching this? When, when do you think the factory is going to be ready? Well, according to our investors, <laughs> uh, we should be ready by October. October. October, but we. That's real soon. Yes, because we have the Christmas season coming. So you already found a place? No, we're still looking. Okay. And we have the funds to get into a place immediately, oh, okay. but we need to prepare the bikes for shipping prior to the Christmas buying season. Okay. Because that is a huge season for bike sales and things like that. So. Well, that's that's really incredible. I'm so happy yeah. for you. You're making <laughs> progress, and. You're doing such a good thing. Thank you. October is coming up really soon. Well, a startup right. has no like time to wait. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's because the big guys can come in any any moment right. and do what you're doing, or you know, or um, or just push you out of the market. So, the speed of a startup is much faster than the speed of an average, average, average business, especially if you want to run, remain, or catch momentum that you may have. Now, what also are you looking for when it comes to employees? Are there certain skill sets that you need right um, now? With no, the business? not right now. Not right now, because what we're trying to do is figure out how our, how our facility is going to operate. 
because part of everything that we want to do is not only take them from being able to do what we do at the factory, but give them a little time to finish their education, uh, to be with their children, to actually work on their own personal, any issues they may have, because we're part of the entire re reentry process. We're not just an, a, a, a company. We're, we're their way back into their community. Mm. We're, even if they do not live in Framingham, but those that do will have a, have a way of being back into the community. And we're trying to make sure that transition is smooth through us mm. in ways that a nonprofit may not be able to. Mm. Okay. Great. Well, I really appreciate you uh, being here today. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I believe we've covered everything. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. And we've looked at the product. You've showed us everything. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, did we miss anything? Um, I let me see if I got anything that we should say. Oh, what we learned from the challenges. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we'll do that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, all right. All right. So we, and we're still good on time. So. Yeah. Uh, so tell me about what you've learned through the course of your business and the challenges that you faced. One thing I learned is that as an entrepreneur, especially a startup entrepreneur, you have to be nimble. This is something that a lot of business schools and a lot of other programs do not teach nimbleness. Like for instance, when I told the story about the garrison and how we did not sell, the normal average way of doing this is making a thousand garrisons and putting them on the market. We had one. So we were able to quickly pivot to the crafts, which led me to another market. Which So it's kind of this fail and fail fast thing, but the ability of a company to be nimble, to find themselves, find their footing, is almost critical to the success of a nonprofit. No, I'm sorry, critical to the success of any small business. And every challenge that you go through is teaching you this, how to be nimble, how to adapt and overcome, because when we see companies that are failing right now, they are the companies that aren't able to adjust. These are the dinosaurs. And a lot of people start their companies as dinosaurs, which is one of the things that we learned you cannot do, especially in 2018. You cannot start your company as a dinosaur based on old information, old adages, or old thoughts and old research. You have to be nimble. You have to be able to adapt, find yourself, and you'll find your market and your footing. Well, thank you for being on the show today. I really appreciate your time. Mm -hmm. I wish you all the best, and we need to stay connected to find out when you're going to start the factory and where you're going yes. to do that around here in the local area or neighboring town. Yes, and I'll bring you in. Okay, yeah. Thank <laughs> you so right. much. Thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm. Thank you.